another thing that is kind of announcement-like, and that is, and so it's a little more serious, I'm not going to take time in this morning's service um, to go there, and to preface, preference this, I actually uh, don't like mixing church and politics, and I, I believe in mixing, you know, church should stand up for morality, it should stand up for things that the Bible talks about. Um, but I don't like the idea that you have to be part of a particular political party to be a Christian. And I don't ever want someone to feel like they, they need to ascribe to a particular political party to be a Christian here at The Rock, because I, I don't believe that. There are sometimes, however, issues that come up that are, are issues of morality. Um, and this week, I'm going to be putting out something um, on our webpage and, and Facebook and, and those places articulating uh, what I believe a Christian's approach should be to the abortion question. And to put it in a nutshell, I'm, and again, I, I, I know that you walk out on thin ice with some people on this, but I, was, I just finished my book about Bonhoeffer. I was halfway done with it last week, um, and, I, and we, preached, we talked about him last week, Bonhoeffer, and how he stood up for the plight of the Jewish people, and he made some statements, um, you know, about how the church and should fit into culture. And so I was convicted, and I thought, you know, church shouldn't be silent on this. And um, so just put it in a nutshell, you know, our, our legislature has passed the strongest abortion laws in the country right now. And uh, people are saying, oh, you're crazy, they're just going to be so expensive to fight it in the courts. Um, you know, if you look at scripture, uh, I don't see how you can get around that God doesn't like abortion. I, I just, you know, you can go through so many different Bible verses. And if you're here today and you've had an abortion or you paid for an abortion, I, I want you to know that God loves you. He's not mad at you. And and His love and grace and forgiveness is available. I, this isn't a legalistic, people are bad who, who have done this type of a thing. I don't believe that at all. I think God loves you and, and He wants to wrap His arms around you and, and heal the hurts that that, that inevitably causes um, that said, I, you know, I believe that abortion is our modern-day silent genocide. And, uh, and this will be in the article that we put out this week. But if you were to take, um, you know, there's about 313 million people uh, in the, living in the United States today. Since Roe v. Wade was passed, uh, there have been 56 million uh, legal abortions in America. If you do the math, 18% of the American population was aborted before it reached, before it was able to be born. That's significant. Um, and I'm personally, and, and I believe God, now you don't see, hear me say this about anything else political that I can think of right now, but I have to think that God is pleased with what North Dakota has done. And, um, and so, I, but I don't believe the church should be silent on it. I don't believe God has a political party, but I think when there are issues of morality, I think it's important the church takes a stand, even if it offends some people. And I don't want to offend you today. I love you, and I want you to come back to church again next week. Um, but someday I'm going to look the Lord in the eye, and I'm going to answer for the things that, um, that we took a stand for in our church. And, and I, I don't want to look him in the eye and tell him, tell him that I pulled my punches with with something as grave and huge as that. That's not what we're preaching about today. I didn't want to take the whole Sunday to talk about it, but I did want to mention it to you to look for it online. Um, and, uh, and and just so you know kind of where I stood and where I believe Christians should stand. Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't I, I think if you're a Christian you should be against abortion. Um, I just I really believe that. Um, but if uh, uh, but Smart people can disagree. If you if you look at it differently for some reason, I'm I'm not mad at you for that. I hope we can still be friends, and I hope you can still come to church. Um, but as a minister and a Christian, and, and as a church, I just felt the need to to do that. Do y'all still love me? Am I okay? Uh, <laughs> and so, without taking any more time for that, would you pray with me? Would you say, Jesus, help me? Jesus, help me. To be what you want me to be. Do what you want me to do. Because people without you go to hell. 
over the next few weeks, we are going to do a series called Red Letter Days. And these are the some of the things that Jesus said while he was on the cross. And Easter is coming up next week. I want to encourage you that I think we're going to have fun next week. Uh, and so it's a great time to pull in family members that wouldn't come to church other times. And, and uh, if they want to, you know, say, well, you know, we're going to be having lunch at our house afterward, but you should really come to church. You know, they pull the, those kinds of strings to get, to get them in here. And Easter is, you know, if it wasn't for Jesus being raised from the dead, there would be no church. There would be nothing would, you know, everything you read all through the Old Testament. And all of that was a getting ready and a boiling for one incredible event. That God is going to come, become a man, and, and take our sins upon Himself. <clears throat> and Easter is is easily it, it's it, without Easter, none of this matters. Without the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, His teachings were good. All of that was good. But our God is a supernatural God, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it's impossible, I believe, to be a a mental Christian that doesn't believe in miracles and doesn't believe in the miracle of God. The fact that Jesus was a virgin when she conceived Jesus. The fact that, that he rose from the dead. That, those are steps of faith that we take, that we just believe in. And, and you have to take that on faith. You know, There's lots of back and forth about all kinds of doctrinal issues and questions. But what it really boils down to, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and the only way to get to God. According to him, the only way that you can experience God, experience good things in the next life, is to put your faith and trust in him. And his death on the cross and his resurrection is the pinnacle, the cornerstone, the, the absolute of our Christian faith. If, if you don't believe in that, you pursue God and, and, and hopefully he'll keep on coming to church. If you have questions whether this is totally right, that's absolutely okay. But when that moment happens, when you say, I can call myself a Christian, as you say, Jesus, I believe in you, I love you, and I give you my life. And I, I believe that you took my sin upon yourself. That, that is the moment that we're all looking for in this church for all the people that we love and care about for our city. Is that moment when they, when they say, we believe in Jesus, we believe that he rose from the dead. <clears throat> and he said some incredible things as he hung on the cross in those, in those last hours. Matthew chapter 27, verse uh, 37. And above Jesus' head, they placed a charge written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You were going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days. Save yourself and come down from that cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said. But come down from that cross and then we'll believe in him. <coughs> he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants to. For he said, I am the Son of God. Here is Jesus on the cross. Just look at it. He's been beaten to the extent that they say his, his, some of his internal organs were exposed. The idea that he survived that beating what was incredible. And nine hours he's on the cross. And, and in case you haven't heard me talk about this before, this was not a peaceful crucifix in the living room, uh, death on a cross. Dying on a cross was a writhing agony. Because they would have go back and forth between putting all of the pressure of his body first on his wrists and then on his hands because he would have to, they would have to lift themselves up in order to breathe. And then the pain would be too excruciating in, in Jesus' feet. And so he would hold himself up as long as he could. And when the pain was too, too much and he would gotten to breathe, then he would go crashing down on his wrists. And he would hang on his wrists, enduring the pain on, on his wrists. And he couldn't breathe. And so then he would have to push himself up again. On his, putting all of his weight on a single nail in his feet. Breathe and come crashing down again. Now, the hard-heartedness and the coldness of, of, 
of humanity is kind of amazing. Here is Jesus beaten, bloody, organs exposed. Not hanging on a cross like we see in our living room, but in a writhing agony. First putting the pressure on his feet, then on over and over again for every series of breaths that he has to take. So every minute or minute and a half, depending on how long it took, he could hold his breath until he had to endure that pain again. It's a writhing thing that's happening. So there's our Jesus hanging on the cross naked with the crown of thorns on his head. His face masked in blood. His body completely broken. Writhing in agony. And walking by, they find it in their hearts to mock him. He tried. He said that he could tear down the temple and build it again in three days. If that's true, why doesn't he save himself? Why doesn't he do something? And then the, the priests and the teachers of the law. Now, this kind of blows my mind a little bit. And I'm and, and really kind of been reflecting on the incredible evil of people after reading about Bonhoeffer in World War II last week and, and those things. The people left to the religious systems apart from God can really become corrupt. They were so corrupt and so hard-hearted and so cold that they saw this man writhing in agony and they felt it appropriate to mock him further. He trusts in God. That was the accurate. He trusts in God. Let God save him. That word trust means in the Greek is pithio. And it literally means <coughs> to convince and to rely on with inward certainty. To have full confidence or complete trust. It's hard to trust when you are writhing in pain. It's hard to trust when your life hurts. You might be here today and you might be living with chronic pain. You know, when that's happening, your whole world is kind of colored, isn't it? It's hard to trust God when you hurt. It's hard to trust God when a relationship that you've had for a long time has ended. It's hard to trust God when you've lost your job. It's hard to trust God when... When your, when your marriage isn't good. It's hard to trust God when your kids are not serving Him and it breaks your heart every day because you know how beautiful and awesome your Jesus is and they don't have that and you do anything, anything to get that to them. It's hard to trust God on the dark days. And Jesus wanted to experience, God had to experience everything that would be common to you in this life. He was completely human. And so there's Jesus experiencing the darkest of his days. It's easy to lose faith at those moments. <clears throat> From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? most troubling and difficult scriptures, I think, in all of scripture. Incredibly important to show us the depth to which Jesus has walked the path you walked. That he's experienced the loneliness that you've experienced. That he knows the pain that you're going through. Martin Luther said, how can God forsake God? And Jesus embraces the question that one point or another, we ask that question, why? Hi, my name is Lisa, and in July of 2008, my husband and I went in for a routine ultrasound at 20 weeks. And we found out then that our baby didn't have a heartbeat. Hi, my name is Scott. About, it was the early morning I got a phone call and it was about my grandson being taken to the hospital. And he was my little buddy. He was, he was a world to me. I have other grandkids, but, but Nova was, he was special. Um, my name is Deidre, and um, my father sexually abused me until I was eight years old. Um, and he also beat the living daylight out of my mother. And when we got there, 
and they had just had just gotten him resuscitated. They admitted him into the, his room, and and it was at that point that I was like, God, why, why? He's not even three years old. Why would you take this precious boy? It made me feel betrayed by God. It made me feel dirty. It made me feel like God left me um, out there by myself. Um, and I asked why. Um, I couldn't understand why God would allow something like that to happen to me. It was about a week when, when he finally uh, passed away. So that was the hardest thing that we ever had to go through. And it was the hardest point in my life. And I questioned and questioned and questioned why, why was this baby taken from us when I never got to hold him or kiss his face. For years, I went into the Cass County Detention Center and, and would play my guitar and, and sing. And, and there was a girl there um, who had been there for a few weeks. Usually, kids would be there for you know anywhere from a week to usually about a month was all that they'd be there, with, with some exceptions. But she had been there for a couple of weeks, so we had gotten a relationship. You know, she'd laugh and I'd do magic tricks, and my dog would come and stuff. And and I'm singing my I'd bring my guitar in, I would sing these songs and I would I would communicate Jesus to them as as best as I knew how. And one night I'm doing my deal and she looks up at me and she says, Pastor Scott, um, my dad has molested me as long as I can remember. And I pray every night, God don't let it happen tonight. And every night he still comes in. And she began to cry. And, uh, you know, completely beyond Pastor Scott's ability to say anything meaningful to her. You know, you going to explain how sin works in this world? You know, that it wasn't her sin, but her dad's sin that had injured her? Are you going to explain, uh, you know, doctrine and theology of why evil exists. There's nothing in this planet that I could have said to her that would even put a band-aid at what she was experiencing. We all run into things and we have moments in our life that we ask why. And it is such an encouragement to me that Jesus experienced the same thing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I couldn't tell this to that girl that night because it would have sounded trite. But no matter how it sounds, there are some truths that we can look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. You see, we only see part of the story. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. You might want to meditate on that verse a little bit this week. It's saying that, God, I don't see what you see. Your ways are, are higher than, than my ways. I know in part, but then I shall know fully. I just can't understand it right now. Now, can you see this? Is there enough light? Nowhere. Nowhere. Sometimes we look at this word and we say, no, and we say mm, this is nowhere. But there's the ability to look at the same thing from a different perspective and say, now where? God, you're nowhere. But I've noticed that after I've walked through some things with the Lord, and I've walked through some painful times and some things that I didn't understand. See, remember I told you that we have to have faith to please God? We have to have faith to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. When I am asking God, you're nowhere, that's a lack of faith. And one of the beautiful things about maturing in Christ, and you walk through more stuff with Him, and, and you get to know Him, you begin to change. And instead of saying, God, why are you nowhere, you begin to ask a more important question, and you begin to say, Lord... 
Now where? Here. 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 Now here. <laughs> God, you're now here. And the first time you walk through some of these excruciating experiences, like, God, what is going on? If you loved me, you wouldn't have let this happen. God, if you really cared about me, there's no way you would have allowed this. But then you live through it, and you begin to see his hand in some of those things in the rear view mirror. Like, you can begin to see. It's like, God, I don't ever want to go through that again. But I really like who you made me as a result of going through that. And you can see that looking backwards. I never see it at the time. But after you've walked through a number of those things, and as you mature in Christ, as you become a more mature Christian, and you hit that, that horrible experience again, you're saying, God, you're now here. I don't understand it. I, I, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why you're doing this. But there's three things that I want you to walk out of here knowing today. And as you mature in Christ, your ability to realize these three things will get better. Number one, God is good. Mark chapter 10 verse 18 says No one is good except God alone God why do you allow such incredible evil in this world Sometimes the things that God allows are not politically correct We're not going to pick it apart today But did you know that one of the main Bible stories that we read to our kids Noah's flood God wiped out a planet How many of you know that that's not very politically correct in our culture You know now, someone can look at that, and, and it's actually an argument that atheists use a lot. They'll say, there can't be a God, because if, if that really, if God's a tyrant, you know, God, God's a murderer, and they, they list these things. But you know what I say as a Christian? I'm not smarter than God, and I trust Him, even if it's not politically correct, because He's good. Number two, God is for me. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Your success is his success. He loves you. And number three, God is with me. He says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So my question for you today is simple. Do you trust God? Where are you on that path of saying, God, you're nowhere, and God, you're now here? Where are you? And it's okay to, to not be there yet, but I, I want to encourage you that Jesus had a moment in his life where for him, God was nowhere. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies on the cross for your sins, for my sins. We sang a song last week. He that knew no sin was made sin for us that we can be his righteousness. You got the verse here for you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He that knew no sin became sin for us, so that in Him we might become His righteousness. That's why we're Christians. That's why we can trust Him. But He had that moment. So I want to encourage you today, if you're in that moment. And I also want to encourage you that the next time you go through hell on earth, there comes a refining, sanctifying process that says, that will take you from saying nowhere to now here. That God, I trust you. I don't understand, but I love you. I don't ever want to go through this again, but I want to get everything from this experience that you intend for me so I can be who you want me to be. So I can do what you want me to do. Because we live in a world that without believing in the resurrected Jesus are going to experience an eternity apart from Him. Would you take your, your prepared cup in your hand and go ahead and peel off that top, that top cellophane. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, He was having the Last Supper with His 12 disciples. They still didn't know what was going to happen. And he took the bread and, and he broke it and he prayed for it and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. So you take a moment and just break that wafer in half, representing Christ's broken body. And let's take it together. Having done this, he, he took the, the wine cup. 
And he raised it to heaven and blessed it. And then he said, This is my blood of the covenant, given to you for the reminiscion of sins. Take and drink all of it. Would you take and let's drink that cup together? And would you just take a moment, and I'm going to let Sam just play that for a second. And I want you to sift your mind. Just close your eyes with me. And ask God to give you a now here heart. Whatever you're going through, give Him your kids, give Him your health, give Him your pain this morning. And ask Him to give you a now here heart. And I'm just going to give you a moment with your eyes closed to talk to God about that. inside of me for students, for youth, for young people. We struggled with the why and um, question, and God showed us throughout the whole process that He was with us and that He He was holding our Isaiah when we couldn't. But it was during the time when we knew that He was going to leave us that he was going to have to go be with our Father in Heaven, that we knew God was in this. We, we, we knew it was. But it was it was difficult to get to that place. We, we really wanted him to be healed. But we, had, we began the process of accepting that God was God and God is good. I would never choose to have my father abuse me. But uh, by God allowing that to happen, um, I'm able, as a survivor, I'm able to tell my students that they too can forgive, they too can survive, they too can be healed um, and live with our true Father. Because of that, man, I can experience the love of my true Father, my Heavenly Father, a love that is pure and unconditional. After trying for a year and a half after losing Isaiah, um, we found out this past Christmas that um, I'm pregnant and um, I have a peace about this pregnancy and that's something that I feel that God has shown me and um, put on my heart and he's been faithful and he's good. The less I ask why, the more I ask what. The less I ask God why, the more I ask God now what. What do you want from me? 